You ought to pray about Monday, pray about Tuesday, Wednesday. Without prayer, I cannot. He wakes up the sinner and the saint. He woke me up this morning. That means you're special. He wakes up a butch the butcher. He wakes up a Moses the molester, you know, you feel, well, he loved me because he woke me up. He woke, he wakes up Lonnie the lyncher every day. And he go, they go right on to do their thing. It ought to make you want to pray every day. Nobody should have to beat you across the head when I finish talking to you today about praying, finding a place to pray. Because you ought to be able to see that prayer is the air that you breathe. It is not ought to be for the preacher. It ought not be for somebody that's finna to teach a class or finna to preach or finna to sing or getting ready to go to court. Got to pay their bills for, for once. <laughs> About to get evicted. Need favor with the landlord and you're four months behind. Come on. You are, it ought to be something that you want to do because you need it. Can you say amen? amen. There, there are really kind of three realms of prayer, and I'm going to be, i got to go through these quickly because I don't want to, I don't want to labor long because the Spirit may want to do something. But there's really three realms of prayer, and I, I'm going to tell you about them rather than, than, than go through all of them because this would be a, a series in itself. But they are three, they're the three realms that the Scripture kind of talks about. First of all, we need to see prayer as breaking through a wall. I think the last 25 years has kind of caused us, because we were imbalanced, to see prayer as a gimme, gimme outlet. Just a hustle, a bip bam, thank you kind of ma'am, a quickie relationship with the Lord, you know, it's been a kind of distorted thing. A whole lot of people haven't got prayers answered. A whole lot of people have uh, received stuff amiss. James, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss. Ask Amos. You ask the wrong person. You ask for the wrong reason. You ask that you can consume it on your own lust. You ask so that you can look good. You ask so that you can be seen. You ask so that you can get the glory you know, everything from houses to cars to we take in the scripture and we twisted them. Amen. Uh, we take things like uh, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If we read that in context, he was that was in context with the Holy Spirit. He was saying, ask and it shall be given, seek and you shall find, knocking the door shall be open. And he began to talk about if a son should ask his father for bread, would he give him a stone? Now, we done twisted dead, ask anything, and we done asked them for clothes, cars, love, money, a trip to Vegas, all of this. It was in context with the Holy Spirit, if you want more of the Holy Spirit. The Scripture says, seek. Uh, excuse me, it says that uh, if seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and the rest of this will be added, you can go to Vegas. You, you can have clothes. You can have cars. said you can have more than one house if you seek first the kingdom of God. But we took stuff like asking it shall be given, seeking you shall find, which had reference to do with more power, more spiritual power, because all things belong to the Lord. You get more spiritual power. You're not going to want a lot of the natural things that you think you want. But we twisted it, and now only thing we want with it is carnal things, physical stuff. And I'm not putting down physical stuff, but the reason that the body lacks power, the body of Christ and Christians lack power is because we don't have very good prayer lives. I was in the prayer closet the other day, and the Lord told me to ask some folk. And uh, I asked one church the other day, and, and, and I know he wants me to ask us, because in the world today, there's a great deal of conversation about who has the bomb, who has the bomb, the nuclear bomb, who got the bomb. Countries are tr uh, got the bomb. They're trying to make sure that rogue states or country don't get the bomb. Israel's trying to make sure Iran don't get the bomb. A lot of people trying to make sure that the rogue states of, of uh, the Middle East don't get the bomb. Today, 
if you just got conventional weapons, you ain't nothing. Just say we got a bunch of army people with AK-47s on the ground. That don't mean nothing. That's like having firecrackers going against a nuclear state. If you're saying that we got uh, the atomic bomb, man, that ain't nothing. They talking hyper nuclear, hyper, I'm not even getting it right. That stuff that goes so fast, hypersonic stuff that goes so fast now that we don't even have anything to keep up with it. And so I was in prayer, and as I was concluding, I had to write it down. The Spirit says, do you have the bomb? Because in prayer, you know, it's a place where you can't pretend and you can't uh, uh, be anybody but who you are. But I got a little crazy. And I said, the Lord, I want you to weaponize my prayer. Amen. I said, I want to I be weaponized. You should ask them sometimes, weaponize my, my prayer life or weaponize my spiritual life. Weaponize. I'm tired of shooting firecrackers at an enemy who's got nuclear stuff. He got a defense system that just knocking our little prayers down. He in the second heaven, and we praying. A lot of us and our stuff is going right up there, and he just swatting it down like a. he got a big old fly swatter. Half our stuff not even reaching the throne of God. I hate to tell you. Our little stuff, we just toss it up, and, and Lord, if you feel like it today, that ain't how you pray. Lord, if it be your will, and you don't know the will of God. The enemy just uh, get that stuff out of here. He like the, uh, the, the NBA player that's seven foot and some change, and you bring that stuff. He's like, get that stuff out of here, knocking it down. And a lot of us, we just say, well, I ain't going to try to do that no more. Shaquille O'Neal knocking my stuff out of the sky. That's the way he showed me a lot of our prayers is going before God. We're in the first heaven down here. The enemy's in the second heaven, and God is in the third heaven. And the deal is, like on a soccer match, you got to get your prayers from the first heaven into the third heavens. So you got to go through the second heavens. And if you are not violent with it, the enemy just swatting it, get that out of here. Amen. And if you don't stay with it, Enemy, get that out of here. So we pray five minutes and think, okay, he heard me. Then we forget about it uh, to watch over it, to continue to bombard heaven with it, to watch over it, to stay with it, to make sure it's getting through, to water it with praise, with thanksgiving, to reinforce it with more word bullets, with more atomic energy. We just, well, we sleepy. We, 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 all kinds of stuff. He showed me. And the enemy just, get that out of here. Daniel prayed 21 days. We pray about something 12 minutes, and we're done. Okay, then we start trying to, well, I know it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. The enemy come with doubt. Then tomorrow we praying about something completely different. And so he asked, he said, do you have the bomb? Do you want the bomb? Do you have an atomic bomb in your prayer life? Most churches don't have it. This church needs it. The atomic bomb, a nuclear prayer life. The early church had it. That means that they prayed until the heavens were shaken, Acts chapter 4. They prayed until the church was shaken. They prayed until something happened. They prayed until the sons got off of drugs. The daughters came home and let sweet Willie go. Prayed till the wife came back. Prayed till the husband came back. Didn't go get a new one. Prayed till souls were saved. So do we have, do you want atomic prayer? Because that's what it's going to take with an enemy that has decided I'm swatting down all the stuff that you are praying for. Even the stuff that's God's will. You got to stand there and stand in the gap and you got to stay there. And some got to get a hold of you. The violent got to take it by force. What is it that you want? Do you even care that your daughter's having sex at 10? Do you even care that your daughter or son is smoking dope at 11? Do you even care that your house is broke up? Do you even care that your spiritual dignity is being walked upon? Do you even care that witches is, is all in your life? Do you even care? Wizards has got you. Most folk don't care. So 
He asked me, he says, do you want atomic prayer? I said, yes, Lord. Because that's the only thing that's going to blow the enemy out of your skies. And you got to be as committed to it as Iran is committed to the bomb. They doing every sneaky thing they can do to find it. You got to do whatever you got to do in the cover of night and day to get what you need to get a hold of this spiritual power that's going to cause that enemy to back up off of me. Because your enemy ain't playing. You're the one playing. So there are three realms of prayer that the Lord will meet you in. I'll say them real quick. Luke chapter 1, verse 11 says, when Jesus' disciples asked him, Lord, teach us to pray, he says, when you pray, say, Father. God will meet you as Father. Father, Father, Father. Most of us need to realize that there is a protocol when we pray. When we go to the Father, go to God, we need to address him as Father. He ain't, hey, dude. He ain't, oh, man, you owe me something. Toss me the keys, my man. That kind of attitude. I deserve. Most of us go to him like the prodigal son. Hey, I want the stuff that Jesus said belonged to me. We go to him with a kind of uh, uh, arrogance. The Bible says, come boldly, so here it is. Amen. It's like your kids, you work down at the farm and you make six figures, man, loan me, give me some money, Pop, I need to go somewhere. Wait a minute, ain't there no respect anymore? Ain't there no dad or, hey, dad, how you doing? Did you have a good day? You have things at the plant? You know, is your health okay? Are you feeling good? Did you, hey, dad, uh, give me $100, I'm finna go out? That's an arrogance that at some point, you like, you ain't getting nothing. And so most of us, the reason we cannot pray more than five minutes is because we do not spend time acknowledging him as the father, our father, father, father. Most of us didn't have a good relationship with our father, and it was that old B or that old he wasn't there, deadbeat D, or was named for him. Yeah, the world and taught us to think of him that way. He ain't ever done nothing for me. He wasn't there. He didn't love my mama. He didn't. So with our heavenly father, we don't know how to appreciate him. He beat my mama. He drank all the time. He, he was a womanizer. But the heavenly father ain't never done you that way. And so when you come into this kingdom, you need to understand that you need to reverence him. He wasn't like your, your daddy. He, he, yeah, he, he been a provider. He was there. He gave you air every day. He made sure you had food every day. He made sure you had a place to sleep every day. Now, I don't know what they did with the check, but he made sure you had a place to eat. You had air. You had blood in the body. He, he did his best to keep you on the upside every single day. And if you want to begin a relationship with him, you do it by saying, Father, Father. If you don't know what that means, do some research on it. Father. It means protector. It means provider. You could spend half, a, half an hour just dealing with his father. 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 My father. My heavenly father. Father that, my God, when you think about it, my, you rich. You got a whole lot of stuff. You own everything. Everybody. Father. So there's a way to approach him. Number one is as father. And sometimes he will answer because he is father. He even gives an analogy that your earthly father can be good, but compared to me, he was evil, even if he was there every day. Compared to me, if you had the best father in the world, he's still evil compared to me. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so is my ways higher than your ways. And I don't care if you say, oh, I had a lovely father. Compared to me, he's evil. And so he wants you to first thing know, come to me like your heavenly father, better than all your uncles. And if you did that, we can start a relationship where you can start getting some of these ends. But you bum rush me because you think I'm daddy fat, fat bag, fat, fat pockets. 
You don't even have the gall to say thank you half the time. You think I'm that rich uncle to stop by and you just got your hand out. At least acknowledge who I am. Because I'm not a man. I'm not a man. I'm like no man you ever met. I'm God. I'm God. I'm not a man. Everything that is, is existence, I created. I could take your life. Don't fear him that kills the body, but fear him that can kill both the body and the soul and then cast it into hell. I'm God. And if you ever learn that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, I'm a consuming fire. That's one way you come to me. The other way is that you, you have to understand in Luke 11, 5 through 8, that suppose a friend had a friend to come to him in the midnight and say, hey, I got some people that have come to me. Can you loan me three loaves of bread? Because these friends have come to me in the midnight, and uh, I can't feed them, and I need some help. You can see God as a friend, and that's where a lot of people are hung up on God. He's my friend. Jesus, he's a friend of mine. And the whole body right now for years, a lot of us here in this room and people that are watching treat God as a friend. Jesus and God are one. He's my friend. Jesus is a friend of mine. So he watch you fornicate, watch you actually take your clothes off and get, get, get jiggy. He's a friend that's watching to make sure the coast is clear. When you're smoking dope, buying beer and cigarettes, committing adultery. You see what I'm saying? We take that friendship too far. He washes when you take that bath afterward, and then he ain't going to tell nobody. Don't tell nobody, Jesus. He don't tell your wife you've been out cheating. Don't tell your husband you've been out cheating. I mean, you done took the friendship too far. He don't tell the church you've been out drinking. Keep your secret. That's why you won't come to the altar and say, help me, I need deliverance. Come on. He don't tell folk the issues you got behind closed doors. We take him as a friend. Jesus would never tell on me. That's why if the preacher or anybody come in and they speak about it, you want to crucify them. That maybe he trying to help you to get that, that demon out of you. To turn your, turn your soul over to him so you can be saved in the day of judgment. We'd rather go to hell. So, yeah, the whole church, we, we, we let he be a friend so he just keep us here. That's why we don't pray for the preacher that revelation would come. Or pray for anybody that's going to teach today that revelation would come because we don't want our stuff to be brought out. And anybody that starts preaching under the anointing of revelation, we don't like them anymore. We say they judge. But anybody that will pray, God will give them revelation. And they don't have to know that you're the one they're talking about. But the Spirit knows because the Spirit knows all things. Come on. We don't talk about dope because ain't nobody doing dope. We don't talk about fornication because ain't nobody fornicating. So we would rather keep Jesus a friend that know our sin, but we don't have to get rid of our sin. We never have to repent, and that's where a whole lot of people are. Jesus see you go to your sin, he see you come back from your sin. But we think he don't, the preacher's so stupid, he don't even tell the preacher. But how you know he don't tell the preacher? Or anybody else for that matter. The Spirit knows all things. So we all play this game, and let's just keep Jesus as a friend, and I won't tell on you if you don't tell on me. 
So we so bold, we tell other people about our sin, and we don't expect them to ever start walking with God to the place that they would rebuke us for our sin. Oh, y'all better shut up. Y'all shouting too loud. We tell other people about the fact that we're committing adultery, and we don't ever expect them to grow up in God and start interceding that we would come out that mess. We tell other people about the fact that we're getting drunk or that we're having sex outside of marriage, and we don't ever expect them to grow up in God, that they would have a relationship with a personal Holy Ghost and go before God and pray against it. That the Holy Ghost plays these little church games, uh -oh. clicks. <laughs> but we forget that the Spirit is truth. And if you keep walking with him, he will separate you from a lie. So there's the realm where Jesus is a friend. But he'll get off when you start trying to play him like a fool, like boo-boo the fool. He will tolerate you for so long, answering prayers, until he see you just trying to play me like a fool. <laughs> You're going to think we friends because I'm still blessing you, gave you a job. Gave you a car, gave you a house, gave you some peace, but you still sleeping with Willie, you still fooling around with Loretta, you still doing them things in sin, you still doing that, and you still think we're going to keep playing this game, but I'm about to cut you off. And the first thing I'm going to do is take away your joy. Because I'm about the truth. I ain't about your flesh. And you're going to have a midnight. Well, you're going to need me. So he'll let you play friends with benefits. And then he'll cut your behind off, and you'll wonder why ain't nothing working for you in the spirit realm. And you'll be sounding brass as tinkling cymbal. You're wondering why you ain't being recognized. You're wondering why it feel like don't nobody respect you, don't nobody want to hear from you, ain't nobody calling you, ain't nobody uh, honoring you. It'll be because you've been cut off in the spirit. You blame everybody else. <laughs> you feel isolated. And then the next thing for you to do is to do the Judas move. Go and commit spiritual suicide. Paul says, except you abide in the ship, then you got to find other places to go to get your fix on, where they'll pump you up and tell you you the booger with the sugar. Other places to go that tell you you got something that you ain't got. Because if you'd have waited in the presence of the Lord and repented of your sins, your haughtiness, your high-mindedness got cleaned in your flesh, you could have been a witness for the Lord for somebody else. But because he gave you space to repent and you wouldn't, you got cut off playing Jesus like your friend. Hey, he like your mama. She'll sit there and laugh and joke with you, but when you call her her first name, pop! Don't you forget who I am. And that's what a lot of folk do. <laughs> Mama will laugh with you sometimes, show you the back of her molars, that she got some wisdom teeth missing, and you'll think, that's Mama bad baby. She like my friend. Dad will do it too. And then when you soon you call him Ralph. <laughs> and say something like, don't you ever. <laughs> you be 60 years old saying, Daddy. And a lot of folk are recognizing now that Jesus is a friend of mine, but he's also king of king and lord of lords, and he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He ain't the little baby Jesus that you can lose for two days and just do your thing no more and come back and be fully restored. You ain't got to like me. I'm trying to tell you 
while your prayers don't work. And then there's the third dominion or the third realm. And in the third realm, I read to you here in the book of Luke chapter 1. And what God is trying to do is elevate us in the spirit realm so we can walk in atomic prayer, nuclear prayer, hypersonic prayer, so that we can go on and do what needs to be done in the spirit realm so we can shine. We can quit playing footsie with the devil. Come on. We can get, get on to the business of why he put us here. Luke chapter 18, verse 1, you read the story about, and he spake a parable unto them, men ought to, this end that men ought to always to pray and not to faint. And there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regardeth man. There was a widow in that city. She came unto him saying, avenge me of my adversary. Say, avenge me of my adversary. First of all, you need to realize that you have an adversary. There's something adversarial against you. Look at your neighbor and say, there's something against you. Don't be a hypocrite. There ain't nothing against me. Something is against you. The biggest trick of the enemy is to make you think that he is invisible, that he doesn't exist, or he ain't bothering you. That you're okay. Even when you're okay, you ain't okay. You just all right, but you ain't okay. Or the Bible never would have said pray, pray without ceasing. I told you about the Lord showed me, he said the tables are stacked against the enemy. There ain't time to go on vacation. There ain't time to go on a sin vacation. You know, the time when you are most vulnerable is when you on top, when you winning. The time when you 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 at the greatest risk of harm is when you got victory. I've learned that when I got victory, man, that's the time I'm most, if, if I can even use the word nervous, is when I know I got victory. You watch Israel. Every time they had victory is when the time you fall. When you think you got it together, when the Lord's blessing you, that's when you ought to hit your face, hit your knees the most. Be most vigilant when it's working for you. When he done blessed you, what you say, God gave you this job. God gave you this. God did this. That's when you ought to hit your face the hardest and stay the longest because that's when you are most vulnerable. That's when most of us take a vacation and go, go to sinning. Forget God. And the enemy broadsides us. We get comfortable. We can't pray no more. Amen. I'm asking God for more grace to fast and pray because I hate it when I get into the eating zone. It gets harder and harder to, to, to feel sure and confident. I get to eating all day. I get the hungry. So I hate that. I don't like that. Can't pass by a smelly place. Yeah, being guided by my physical senses. Ooh, what's that? Gyro smell? Ooh, ooh. Whip around. Barbecue? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Fish frying? Ooh, ooh. I hate that. Take me off my game. Take me, keep me from being sharp in the spirit realm. My spiritual senses become dull. Get knocked over the head by the enemy. But he says right here, there was a widow in that city, verse 3, she came unto him saying, avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while, but after what he said within himself, though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because of this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said, and shall not God avenge his own elect which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I would tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Now, the question is asked. He says, uh, uh, I tell you, he says, he says, and verse 7, and shall not God avenge his own elect, that which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. Day and night, though he bear long with them. The enemy tried to sell us this thing that we don't need to cry day and night unto the Lord. We don't need to. All we need to just uh, believe it, just believe it. But I want to I wanna 
submit to you that you just can't believe without uh, warring in the spirit. Amen. Because there's an enemy that is against you. Turn to the book of Daniel chapter 7. And this sets us up for a scenario that you need to pay attention to when you pray. Amen. I'm hoping if you see this in the spirit realm, what I'm about to show you, that it's going to change how you approach God. Amen. Now, I know you know how to pray, and your mama taught you how to pray, and, and you've been going to church, and you know how to pray. Can't nobody tell you how to pray and all that. And, and you know how to pray, and you know the Lord love you and all that. Uh, hallelujah. But uh, you might be praying AK-47 prayers. You might be praying shotgun prayers. But we need to move on into nuclear prayers. We need to move into prayers that just annihilate the enemy. We need to, we need to get hold of a prayer format like heaven, get heaven involved in our prayers. We need to quit praying these desperado prayers, these prayers that uh, they're like shooting a shotgun. If you know a shotgun is full of uh, buckshots and little BBs and you just shoot and you don't have to really aim straight at something, you can almost hit it off to the side and you get it. We need to pray in such a way that we just wreck, wreck the enemy. Amen. We need to pray about whatever we are praying for to the fact we're praying like Jesus prayed. We're praying with the mindset. The Bible said we have the mind of Christ. We I mean we think like Christ thinks when he stole away at night. We need to pray in the way that Daniel prayed. Daniel prayed three times a day. Even when he was 80 years old and he could barely get up and down, he prayed. He opened his window and he prayed. And the Bible says about Daniel, many times you read it, oh, Daniel, man, greatly beloved. It uses that terminology toward Daniel because Daniel had a prayer life. We need to pray even though we can't kneel like we could when we were 14. If we got to sit on our stump and pray, we need to pray. We need to pray and we need to go through prayer and go pray all kinds of prayer. The prayer supplication. Need to learn it. That's humbly pleading. The body of Christ have gotten to the place and Paul wrote about it. We need to pray a prayer and supplications be made. Supplications, humbly pleading, humbly pleading. Somebody told us, well, you don't have to plead because the Jesus, da, 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 humbly pleading, pleading, humbly pleading, humbly pleading. I hate to even use the analogy of having a child or something about to check out of here and they was young, but you would scream and holler in St. Anthony's till they had to come get security and throw your behind out of there. Some of y'all for your parents, you scream and holler and, and, and act a fool. But humbly pleading, atomic prayer, nuclear prayer, the prayer that God wants the church to have, not just Shepherd's Fold Ministry, the Shofar International Harvest Ministries, but the body of Christ, earth-shaking prayer. That's going to bring in the harvest because the Lord is concerned about the harvest. Amen. It's going to take humble pleading for the lost. We got to get the heart that God has for every human being. For people that you don't sleep with. But they kind. Because you know somebody just like them. May not have the name of your kinfolk on them, but you related to somebody that act just like them. And if God is saving the murderers, and you got some in your family, you need to make, get the murderers saved. If he's saving liars, get the liars saved. Please include me and them in my family. Amen. The Ten Commandments, amen. 
Praise the Lord. If you're saving those that have other gods, don't discriminate and leave out the Conleys and them that got different name other than the Conleys, but they got Conley blood in them. Please, don't just save the Conleys because we're not that big of a family anymore. But save all them when they, they, they intermingled with other names and the babies took on the mama's last names or whatever. They got kindly blood in them. Save all them that got other gods in them. Because the Lord's will is not that any should perish. We need to come to the place that all of those who got graven images, all of those who use the name of the Lord in vain, all of those who profane his Sabbath, all of those who won't honor their mother and father, all of those who kill, all of those who commit adultery, all of those who steal, all of those who bear false witness, all of those who covet, all of those who break any of God's laws, that they give their life to the Lord. Until we can find that heart, God is saying, you don't know me. You don't know me. But how do we begin? How do we get there? We begin 